A critical link in port operations that you won't find on the waterfront, surprisingly, are the customs brokers and the freight forwarders. In the early days of the port, they were located near the customs house in Baltimore City for ease of operation. But technology has changed all of that. Now you'll find one of the oldest, the John S. Connor Company, headquartered near BWI. My grandfather actually started the company back in 1917 after attaining his customs broker's license in, in May of that year. Uh, his mother lent him $300 and he got a uh, telephone and a typewriter and he was in business. The waterfront was a very different animal than it is now. And in those days, most of the shipping companies and customs brokers, freight forwarders, all had offices within a two or three block radius of the custom house. From the customs brokerage side, um, the documents are a key component of what we do. We have to get the bills of lading, we have to get the commercial invoices and packing lists and other import do documents that are required to affect the import in compliance with all customs regulation. You don't have a right in the Constitution to import. It's a privilege. So you have to have a customs bond. You have to comply with all the regulations. You have to give a customs broker, which we are a power of attorney, to represent you before customs. This is the United States Harmonized Tariff Schedule, which contains all the products that could be imported into the United States. And it's set up into minerals, animals, fish and wildlife, finished goods, could be any type of product. So we can review a commercial invoice of an importer and decide where in a tariff this is going to be. There's thousands and thousands of tariff classifications in here. And our expert entry writers can find the tariff classification that fits the product that a given importer would be bringing in. And then we can determine whether it is dutiable at all. Uh, is it dutiable for uh, justice from a specific country of origin? Is it subject to any specific trade agreements that give it special duty or preferential treatment and make a determination as to how we're going to enter this merchandise with U.S. Customs? On the freight forwarding side, it's more about the handling of the cargo itself. So we're making the arrangements, whether it's import or export, find the right ship that's going to meet the transit time requirements and the budget of our customer and make arrangements to get that product booked on the ship, loaded on the vessel. Once this, the cargo is on board the ship, then we prepare the bill of lading, the ocean bill of lading, and present it to the carrier, which has all the standard terms and conditions, but then has a specific description of what is the cargo on board, who is the shipper, who is the consignee that's going to be receiving the cargo, and what port of discharge is going to be going to. Typically, there are weekly sailings going to our major trading partners, like in Europe or Asia, Latin America, Middle East, the carriers uh, want you to make a booking uh, at least a week or two ahead of the sailing, not too far ahead of the sailing when their schedule might be adjusted, and then they'll give us a cutoff date. If it's sailing on a Friday, they typically want the container delivered 24 to 48 hours prior to sailing to ensure that it's going to be in their stowage plan and get on the ship. I was just starting a file for a 20-foot container from India to Norfolk. I am filing the customs for a shipment uh, going to Hong Kong. Between all of our company operations, you know, we're handling hundreds of export shipments a month and thousands of import shipments. Our business sort of reflects the country's balance of trade, or imbalance of trade, if you will. So, like most in our industry, we have more import transactions than we do export transactions. Most of us in the custom brokerage freight forwarding business are what we call non-asset companies. So one of our jobs is we're going out to the marketplace and try to find the best solution for our customers' logistics needs. What's the carrier that's going to be the most cost efficient, cost effective, and meet their time requirements to get their product from point A to point B? So we go to the marketplace and find the best one for them. Every day is different. It's always a challenge. We had that folk life festival cargo to DC, and it was a, ch a struggle trying to get it there in time. All kind of complications um, from the uh, Food and Drug Administration wanting to examine it for some kind of a pesticides that were in the in the wood product and I have to be fumigated and custom delays and then we had to, uh, we missed the rail cutoff so we had to truck it cross country to make it there on time. One of the big things about being a freight forwarder is you got to be flexible. You got to all the time be ready to problem solve and that was a good example of what Diane and her crew did. This is a hyperbaric chamber used in hospitals. It was 66 tons, 52 feet long, 12 feet wide, 10 feet high. So we had to make all kinds of special arrangements with cranes, special trucks to move it. And it's very interesting because it's not your standard put in a 44 container shipment.